Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A generous crowd. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to Chesapeake College's inaugural last lecture. John asked me to offer just a few words of introduction on his behalf, and it is my privilege to do so. My name is Dave Harper, Assistant Professor of English here at the college. Uh, I've been here for 10 years and had the privilege of learning from and teaching with John. John Carl Haas, Associate Professor of History, has worked in the field of education for nearly 25 years, serving four colleges since 1991, when he joined the faculty at Horry Georgetown Technical College. John went on to serve as a faculty administrator at Midlands Tech in South Carolina and Delaware County Community College, just nearby. But his desire to return to his true passion, teaching in the classroom, brought him to Chesapeake College in 2004. Since that time, he has garnered many awards and honors, including just a few of which would be Faculty Member of the Year, the Stuart M. Bounds Distinguished Teaching Chair, a responsibility as Middle States Co-Chair. He shared that with Chandra Gigliotti. Thank you, John, by the way, for not jumping off the roof during that very trying time and guiding us so competently through. Most recently, John is the first faculty member chosen by students and peers for this event, the last lecture. Of course, there is certainly much more to John than his impressive resume would suggest. So in preparation for this evening, I spoke to his wife, Kate, and she dug through the extensive Haas family archives. And she shared with me a few photos. Now, I don't want to suggest John is getting old but suffice it to say that most of the pictures Kate gave me were black and white. <laughs> they were very revealing, <clears throat> very telling, and they gave me insight into how John became the man that we honor here today. So I would like to share some of those photos with you. John's passion for the subject of history is authentic. Specializing in American and military history, John draws from his education, having earned bachelor's and master's degrees from Penn State, and astonishingly, from personal experience. <laughs> I don't want to say John isn't getting any younger, but Chesapeake College was founded in 1965, and here John is in 63, serving as congressman and speaker of the house during the Kennedy administration. <laughs> Who knew? Competent historian and teacher John is, but I have to say he is also a bit of a geek. The man has more board games than I have books, and I'm an English professor. There is an entire room, I kid you not, in John and Kate's house dedicated exclusively to board gaming. And these things can be played online now. <laughs> Perhaps you know that this stems from John's interest in military history. But did you know that John's interest in military history stems from his service to our country as a general during World War II and in Korea? Here he is with Air Force General Hap Arnold and General Patton to the far left. The Haas family photo archive shows us that these types of passions are long running in John's family. Here is a rare image of John's great grandfather, Johan, clairvoyant Haas, posing as a Confederate sniper in one of Matthew Brady's most controversial photographs of the Civil War. You see that smile? This image incidentally also shows the long Haas family tradition of remaining pretty positive and upbeat in just about any situation. <laughs> now I wasn't going to mention this, it's hard really even to talk about it, uh, even though in so many ways John appears to be a perfectly respectable and reasonable academic. <laughs> well, there's no easy way to say this. John is a NASCAR fan. <laughs> it seems that at some point John took a hiatus from his military service, donated his neck to charity, <laughs> stopped his political career and his teaching duties to serve as crew chief for his beloved driver, Tony Stewart. This is true, that's his favorite driver. Finally, though we honor him here today, 
I do think it is time that we stop ignoring, stop tacitly overlooking John's obsession, nay, addiction to Penn State football. I am sure you know he is a Nittany Lion, but did you know that now that he's no longer spending nights and weekends sleeping in the LRC, consumed by the college's accreditation process, thanks again for that, John, now that that weight has been lifted, John has taken a part-time job coaching his beloved team. <laughs> but there is truth in this picture. In the classroom and on campus, John is one of the most natural coaches I have ever seen. I am proud to call him colleague, mentor, and friend. In the IDC course we taught together, I have seen John firsthand over and over again, time and again, encouraging students on a personal and meaningful level, choosing to recognize and celebrate the good in them. He does the same thing for fellow faculty and for others in his life. For that, we are grateful. Residents in Louisville, Kentucky, site of the alternative spring break, are grateful. Churchill Theater, is grateful. His cats are grateful. <laughs> His lovely wife, Kate, is grateful. And so similarly, we wish to recognize and celebrate our good colleague, mentor, and friend. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. And it is now my privilege with you to introduce and applaud Associate Professor of History, John Haas. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Wow, what an intro. Who'd have known I had such a career? Aw, isn't that nice? Well, um, let me first say that I was, I am incredibly flattered uh, to be asked to do this. This is, uh, since this is the first time the college has chosen to do this, I certainly want to extend a, a thank you to the students in SGA and the students that are part of that, uh, that process that, uh, that decided to do this for the first time. Uh, and uh, as well, I want to thank uh, Harriet Lowry uh, and uh, Rory Flood for all the amazing work that they do with our students. And, uh, there are times when they're so behind the scenes, people don't recognize how much the two of them do for the students, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it is important. <laughs> Let me first assure all of you that as far as I know, I'm not dying, <laughs> at least not in the near future that I know of, and I'm not retiring. Um, this is a, uh, this concept of the last lecture uh, is one that was, I believe was founded at one of the California universities and the idea is to, uh, if I had one last opportunity to speak to students, what would I want to say? What would I want to tell them about? And so that's, that's what this is all about in terms of meaning a last lecture. Um, I struggled for a long time to sort of frame what I wanted to say. There were lots of ideas bouncing around in my head trying to figure out what would be a, uh, a good way to look at it. Um, I, I know that throughout my life I've learned a lot of things from my family members, from my friends, uh, from my coworkers, from my students, uh, and I know that in, in so many ways those interactions have shaped who I am and the things that I consider to be important. And so as I was kicking all these ideas around, I realized that one of the things that I've done in response to all that is that as I get older, I continue to try to grow and use the things that I've learned uh, to try to shape what I do and the, the things that are important to me. So, with all that sort of knocking around in my head, um, I, it occurred to me that in many ways this is probably a, a type of universal process for a lot of us, that we, we take in the things that are occurring around us and we try to figure out what it means in the big picture and what we should do in response to it and try to organize ourselves to, to be better and more effective in the future. We try to learn from our parents and our teachers and other folks. Uh, and I think that's a kind of natural cycle. It's, it's, you, know, you could think of it as, as uh, something that might be faith-based, it might not be, but it's all part of what I think we all go through and, and what we learn. So with that in mind, it occurred to me that um, what I have here is a kind of central topic. 
uh, which is that we all experience things. We are influenced in many ways by the things that go on around us um, and that we respond to them. So it occurred to me, if that's true, if that's, if that's a given, that also means that we have the ability to be, uh, to play a role in influencing the people around us and hopefully in a positive way. So I think it's a, in many ways, it's, it's an opportunity here to think about, well, yeah, we can be influenced by those around us, but it also means we can turn that around and have a positive effect on them. So I thought what I would do is walk you through a little bit, a, a few of the things that I've learned that have occurred to me and the way I've been influenced. And I think you'll probably, most of you will see some similarities in your own life. You'll have somebody that fits in that slot for you. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what, um, what we can do going forward from here uh, to be a positive influence. All right, we'll start here. Um, I, I would think I'm about four in this photograph, I think. Um, I was, uh, my family was living in Levittown, Pennsylvania when I was born, just north of Philadelphia. And we lived there until I was five and then moved to State College, Pennsylvania, up in the mountains. It's right next to where Penn State University is. And uh, I have, um, so this was, the mountains are really my hometown. I, the State College is really my hometown. My parents, uh, John and Jean, um, uh, my father uh, was a, uh, uh, an architect, ran his own firm. Uh, my mother was a, uh, an elementary school teacher and a homemaker. And um, I had a good childhood. I really did. I, um, I was the youngest of three sons, no sisters, uh, youngest of three sons. But before you get carried away and start to think, well, was he one of those youngest spoiled kids? Was he one of those? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I think um, I'll let you know that my brothers continuously reminded me that I was not special. Uh, and that was, uh, that's very reassuring from their point of view. I don't know about for me. Um, my parents were both Penn State graduates. Uh, and this meant that um, this was an important part of who we were growing up. Certainly who I was growing up. Uh, and they were, uh, that meant that they tended to host a lot of gatherings in State College because they were graduates who then returned to State College to live, their uh, extensive network of friends uh, would come to town in the, in the, uh, for football weekends in the fall uh, and would stay with us uh, and go to the football games. And this meant that my parents, who were both only children, uh, meant that I had no aunts and uncles. So all of these folks who came to town in the fall all acted as a type of... Uh, extended family of aunts and uncles for me. Uh, they were all um, very supportive, wanted to know what I was doing in my life, uh, and I waited anxiously for them to show up uh, for, for fall uh, weekends, uh, even sitting out on the front stoop waiting for them to show up on a Friday night after work. Uh, and that's all part of what I remember growing up, uh, was not only my family, but that kind of extended family that was a part of what we did. And I learned a lot about true lifelong friendship through this. Uh, my, my father was a Sigma Chi, my, um, my mother was an AO Pi, a sorority sister. Uh, they both had uh, large numbers of friends who were sorority sisters and fraternity brothers, and many of them married one another. Uh, and so there was a, uh, this long-standing extensive network. They still get together with one another uh, after all these years, and that's kind of amazing to me. Growing up in State College also means that I was always surrounded by all things Penn State. Uh, some of you may be shocked to know that I went to Penn State because I don't talk about it. Uh, but it's, it is so much a part of who I am and what I experienced. And uh, one of the things that went with this was uh, the, the, the concepts and the ideas and the things that were important, not necessarily to Penn State football, but that were embodied in the things that Joe Paterno taught. Now, it's hard for folks that didn't grow up in State College to know the kind of impact uh, that a man like this had when I was growing up. Yes, football was important. Sure it was. 
But he made it really clear to everybody that football was one thing in life. It wasn't everything. Uh, he, was an enorm he was a big backer of, uh, of other values that were more important. Education. He was a big backer of modesty. Uh, and he was someone that, that emphasized teamwork. I mean, I know Dave had some fun with the Penn State uniforms, but to me, the uniforms are a great embodiment of all that. They're simple, boring, uh, no names on the jerseys until now, uh, and it showed in many ways the notion of modesty and teamwork and education, very high graduation rate. And this is, these are the ideals that kind of permeated uh, the town that I grew up in. These are the things that were considered to be important. And it's something that um, folks outside State College probably have never really understood. In fact, to give you an idea of, of how modest um, Joe Paterno was, he, um, every year during the homecoming parade, they always had a, a Joe Paterno look-alike contest. And people came in with the glasses and the rolled up pants and the, the white socks and all that. And I love Joe's response one time. They asked him about it and his response was, why would anyone want to win that? <laughs> uh, and uh, that to me is a sort of self-deprecating humor that's very appealing to me. Okay, like many of us, public school was important. I went to State College Area High School. I had two particular history teachers that were very influential to me. Uh, Dr. Wilkerson, my 10th grade world cultures teacher, was a guy who taught me that learning about history actually can be a lot of fun. That there can be humor in all this. It's not just memorization, it's a kind of exploration. And the other thing he did is he taught us to have a, poke a little fun at ourselves in the process because we can learn from what other people did and reflect on it a little bit. He was one who always poked fun at himself whenever he was teaching. Now Dr. Farrow was my 11th grade American history teacher. He had a different effect on me in that he, um, he taught me that historians should be fair and honest. And probably as important to me, from those of you who had me in class, he also taught me that historians should grind their own personal political axes on their own time. That the classroom is not where you do that. And he was influential to me in terms of uh, it's about the study, it's about honesty, it's about fairness, and it's not about trying to make some point in current day. And one of these things that he helped with me was that we had a conversation one day, uh, keep in mind here, I was 16, uh, we had a conversation where I thought that there wasn't enough information in his class, that he taught American history, but he'd always get to the wars and then he'd skip over them. And I thought, well, how can anybody know what occurred and why it occurred that way if they didn't understand it? And he said, well, why don't you teach it then? So, one day I... Uh, I got together, and Dave was poking fun about my board games. Um, some of my board games have these big maps, and so one day in class, I went down to one of the big lecture halls, and I, I laid the map out on the, on the, the uh, stage there, tacked it all down, and he brought the class down, and for about 20 minutes, I taught the class what happened in World War II in Europe. That's the first time I've ever taught anything. And he was very supportive. I mean, he didn't try to shut anything down. He didn't argue with me. He said, well, let's do it. Let's try it. And every time I would go back to see him years later and say hello to him, he always talked about that. Uh, and it clearly had an impression on him, and it certainly made an impression on me that he encouraged me in a way that no one else had before in that, in that realm. And I learned from him that well, you, you, can, you can be experimental. You can risk at times in terms of what you teach. By the way, I would love to have had photographs, but the only ones I could find were in my yearbooks, and they were about this big. Uh, and I just thought they'd never look good on the, on the screen. Okay. Now let's go to Penn State. Once I graduated high school, I got to Penn State. I didn't want to go anywhere else. In fact, it was the only college I applied to as an undergraduate. Good thing I got in. Um, this was a, the only place I ever wanted to go. My parents were both Penn State graduates. I wanted to be a Penn State graduate. That's who I was. So this was really important to me, to be a part of this. I um, got through my four years, and as I was finishing my bachelor's degree, I met Kate. And 
Uh, Kate and I met when we were both working in my brother's pizza shop. And um, probably should have been dating her earlier. Kate loves to tell the story about how I asked the wrong girl out at the shop. <laughs> Which was a mistake. Believe me, it was a five month mistake. <laughs> but Kate hung in there. Uh, and she asked me out ultimately and I said yes. Uh, and we will hit 25 years as of this summer. So. Now, Kate has taught me a lot of things over the years. And I was trying to figure out how could I sort of encapsulate this, how could I put it in words that would, that would see, that would show the way I see it. And I think one of the things that she's taught me is do the right thing. Not because there may be some benefit in it, but do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Simple. Uh, and there have been a number of times over the last 20 some years where we've been in situations and we did that, um, regardless of what the outcome might be. And I think that her strength in that, in that area has been, has taught me a lot, has helped me. Um, she's also taught me to care about others. And the way she sees it is, it's oftentimes the little things that matter uh, in terms of taking care with others. So thanks, Kate. In terms of my academics, this is probably the most important person to me. Um, Dr. Gallagher uh, came to Penn State as a, as a new, uh, newly minted PhD in 1984. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I took classes with him. Uh, he is one of the leading Civil War historians in the country now. Uh, and I was one of his first graduate students and I just ate up everything he could send my way. Uh, he inspired me and uh, got me fired up about all things uh, history and he enhanced my love of it. Uh, and I also learned from him how to teach. David, uh, David and I oftentimes, David Harper and I have oftentimes had conversations about how do you put a class together? How do you structure it? Dr. Gallagher was one of the best at it. He wasn't even paid to teach, he was paid to research. But he was an awfully good teacher. And one of the things he always did was, he laid out a structure, he had a plan about how he was gonna get someplace within his course. And he told the students about it. He let them understand why things were put together the way they were and how he was gonna get them there. That taught me a, a lot about communication within a course uh, and, and how to have a clear vision of what you wanna accomplish. He's now at University of Virginia, which I got to see him more. Um, now, I combined all these things, uh, and I discovered at the end of my uh, bachelor's and master's degrees that I wanted to teach, and I wanted to be someplace where I could make a real difference. Community colleges were the logical place for me. And so I began uh, applying, and I had some good fortune. This is a, photo, a photograph of the main building at Horry Georgetown Technical College. It's a strange looking title. Uh, that's, that's not Horry, it's Ori. Um, the H is silent. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the name of the county where Myrtle Beach is in South Carolina. And Georgetown is the county to the south. So in uh, 1991, I was hired as a full-time instructor by the woman pictured here, Dr. Marilyn Four, better known as Murph. She took a gamble on me. Maybe she shouldn't have, based on my, my uh, experience that up to that point, but she took, a, she took a gamble with me. And Dr. Gallagher, from what I understand, had a conversation with her when she called, and she said, what, what should I do? I'm, I, I don't know whether to hire him or not, and from what she told me, Dr. Gallagher said, you cannot lose on this one. So, um, I always told her afterwards, I said, you were nuts to hire me. She kept saying, no, 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 I knew what I was doing. Um, one of the things I learned from Murph was, Follow your instincts. Oftentimes when you're in a situation and you're not sure what to do, listen to your gut, it will tell you a lot. And she was one of those who taught me a lot as I was just starting to get the hang of some administrative things. She taught me how to, um, how to cut through some of the things that oftentimes people get stuck in. Um, very influential, uh, influential. I think she's now the senior vice president there. All right. See where I am here. Now, with all those influences in my life, I think pretty well. College instructor by 25, homeowner by 20, 27, department chair by 29, 
a dean by 34, and more, most importantly, a professor here at Chesapeake by 37. I'm pretty proud of that. So I've done well. I've had a lot of really good influences on me, a lot of folks who have tried to steer me in the right direction and done good things for me. So with that being the case, now, what can I do to stay positive? What can I do to continue to be good at what I, uh, or work at what I do, and then to try to be positive for the people around me and help them be better at what they do? So, I've got eight that I'm going to list for you here. When you get out into your professional life, take on the tough tasks. When stuff comes up at the workplace and they need somebody to do something that's not going to be easy, take it on. I know it stinks. It's easier to fly under the radar, let somebody else handle it, but take it on. One of the things that's good about this is you're doing a good deed for the people around you. You're doing something positive for them that they're apprehensive about. Take it on. And in fact, the struggle that you go through, it might stink while you're in the middle of it, but you may learn a lot from it. And the struggle itself can be a, a real confidence booster when you get through it. Take on the tough task because you will ultimately help the people around you and isn't that what this is supposed to be all about? So that's number one. Two, don't let yourself get stale uh, and, and stagnant in what you do. Try some new things once in a while. Try some things that you haven't done. Um, one of the things Kate got me to do, I had always been a dog person growing up. We had a, we had a Welsh Terrier, a little medium sized dog and Josh was cool, he was great. Then, once we got married, Kate said, nope, I'm a cat person, I don't want dogs. I was a little unsure about this. She sold me on it, though. <laughs> and I am now a cat person, no question about it. And in fact, we have crossed a dangerous threshold in the last month. We now have five of them. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work out. But that was a try at new things, and I'm convinced. I love the little guys. That's Milo, Jules, and the new one, Jamie. Uh, so, a couple other things about not getting stale. I was just talking to David backstage. I think it's seven years ago this semester, we did Death of a Salesman on this stage. I had never acted before in my life, my adult life, I should say. And just on a whim, uh, in 2007, Anita TC, who was our theater professor at the time, uh, they were doing a show that I thought might be a little fun, and I thought, well, even if I, I'll, I'll audition, even if I'm awful, it's a comedy, what do I care? The students will be laughing at me as opposed to laughing with me, what do I care? And we had some fun with it, and I got hooked. So we did the comedy in the fall, and then we did Death of a Salesman here uh, in the spring, and I've been doing it ever since. This is a photo of a uh, show I did about four years ago now uh, called Chapter Two, a uh, Neil Simon play. Uh, Jeff Daly played my younger brother. Um, I've continued my interest in theater. In fact, I now I got an opportunity this past summer to join the board at Churchill, uh, at the Churchill Theater. And so now it's another opportunity for me to kind of give back and to help. All right, one last one on this one. But three years ago, Dave Harper and I decided to teach together. There's a course that we have at the college called IDC 201, which is a, uh, called the Nature of Knowledge. And there's usually a lot of flexibility as to how you teach this course. So David and I decided we would take it on. But we promised ourselves something. We said, all right, we're going to do something that neither of us have done before. And we are going to not only put the students out of their comfort zone, we are going to do it to ourselves. We are going to do something that we are not comfortable with and we'll experience it with the students. And so one of the things we tried was to do a, uh, we focused on, remember this was three or four years ago so it was, life's a little different. Twitter was brand new at the time. And more and more students were getting smartphones and more and more students were using it. And we were talking about the concepts of uh, technology and the impact on life and David, who, if any of you know anything about David, he, is, he loves the outdoors and he loves camping and all kinds of things. And so this was a, we thought, well, let's explore this. Let's see what, what students are experiencing. And we decided as one of the activities in this course, we were going to try something neither of us knew about. 
and weren't sure how it was going to work. And what we did is we got, uh, we designated a week in which we had every student in the class, all 25 of them, we required them to get Twitter accounts, and we required that they follow one another, they had to connect with everybody in the class, and they were required to post, to tweet, at least five times a day for a week. That meant that they were not only doing their own tweets, they were getting everybody else's tweets. And the idea was to, as we called it, to hyper-connect them together. To have them so connected they couldn't stand it. At the end of that week, we went camping. And we disconnected them. And we went around and we, we went for, to camp overnight and I went around with a bag as, as the cars arrived and I collected all their telephones. And nobody could have a cell phone for, uh, for a full day. You should have seen some of the students. <laughs> the thought of giving up their phone, it was just more than they could handle. Um, and we not only went camping, we, took, we went to Tuckahoe State Park and we did the High Ropes Challenge course. Uh, and so we got them out into the woods and they experienced some things where they had to work together and they had to challenge some of their fears. Uh, and one of the neat things that came about from all this was not only were they experiencing something new, they were doing it together and they were cheering each other on. They were having such a ball trying to overcome these obstacles and to work together that it had, uh, it was amazing. Some of you may know Nick Nowotnik on the right side. He, um, he's, I think he's still in the minor leagues in baseball. He's still playing. So we had a lot of fun. There's a rock climbing wall. You get to the top of the wall and you have a, uh, um, a zip line you go down. And this was quite an experience. I don't know, is this the same photograph you used there? I think so. Uh, and uh, we've, we did this over two semesters and we had a blast each time. So we didn't get stale. We found something new and we found something that worked. I don't know, we may have captured lightning in a bottle. We may never be able to do that again. But it worked at the time. Uh, and we had a lot of fun with it and we learned a lot from it as well. Okay, number three, be a team player. I found out Rory is the king of the selfies. <laughs> this, uh, this last month, for the first time, I got a chance to join the alternative spring grape group that went to Louisville to build houses. And so we took eight students and Rory and myself piled into a van and we, went to, we drove all the way out to Louisville and we built we helped to build houses for four days. Uh, and we worked as a group, we worked as a team. Uh, one day, the, was it the fourth day I think, right near lunch, we're all up on the ladders together, the whole crew was working on one spot in the house and we were all helping one another and it was amazing. It was great to see everybody pulling together and working as a team. The guy you see in the UCLA basketball shirt, he's the gentleman who is gonna get the house when it's finished. Uh, and Cheney was enormously thankful for our work there uh, he says, is it two little girls he has? Three, Three little girls. Uh, and he's studying to be a minister. Uh, and he needs a place and this is going to really help him. Uh, and so it allowed us to work as a team, to learn together, to pull together and do something really nice for somebody else. Uh, and it's, um, it's an amazing experience to go through when you can do something for someone else. And I have to tell you, by the time we got back, I was so full. Inside joke. I, I should say, I should say that I, I want to thank the students that were on that trip. Um, Maddie, I've wrote it down because I don't want to forget anybody. Maddie, Michael, John, Sarah, Megan, Nicole, Caroline, Danny, and Rory. So thank you for an amazing experience. It's one I will never forget. I hope they get to do it again sometime. Okay. You can all ask me later, I'll fill you know what that was all about. But I had to say it. All right. All right, number four. Always give praise to other people when you have an opportunity. And I don't mean just a thank you on your way out of some store. Turn to somebody and say, thank you. It's amazing how many of us will go through weeks and months without some good word from some individuals. So when you get a chance, say thanks. You might make that person's day, or week, or month. So find an opportunity. Find the good in a situation. Wherever you can, we're always going to 
Uh, we're always going to stumble into situations that aren't necessarily what we want to be in the middle of. But try to find something good in it. Try to find something positive. Um, when I was 19, my mother passed away. And um, however rough that was, one of the good things that came from it was that my father and I, who had never been close, got to know one another better. And we spent a lot of time together in those, in those intervening years. And unlike my other two brothers, I am a football fan, like my dad. And so the two of us have spent a lot of time at Penn State football games. And we really enjoy talking about it and following it and being a part of it. And it's one of the things that we have in common. He is, without a doubt, my best friend. My dad has taught me to serve others for the sake of serving them for their interest. Work to help others. Uh, and He's also taught me to easily forgive the faults in others because God knows we have enough of them ourselves. Uh, and, and always do that. And I've never known anyone who is as kind as he is. I have also inherited from him the ability to cry at the drop of a hat. Thanks, Dad. Okay. Almost done. I did a play a few years ago called Our Town. For those of you that may know it, it's a play uh, that is set in the 1890s. It's about a small town in New England, in uh, New Hampshire. And the play is about how, um, the, the point of it is to talk about how most people aren't really aware of their lives while they're experiencing them. Uh, that we rush through life doing things and we never really are conscious of all the wonderful things around us. Now many people see this play as very, very much a downer. I don't see it that way. It's a reminder to me to be in the moment. Be conscious of all the wonderful things going on around you. Um, and I, I've started calling them Our Town Moments. Kate's sick of hearing me say that. But they're Our Town Moments. For me, this is one of them. I'm getting a chance to talk to you. I'm having an amazing experience that I probably may never have again. So I'm trying to really enjoy it. I'm soaking it in. And when you're in those moments, Express it. Talk about it with the people around you. It helps to sort of lay those memories in that so you can keep them. Now the student here on the screen uh, is Janine Lowenberger. She was a, a student from Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, who uh, came to go to school here a few years ago. She played on the softball team. And when she finally graduated, she was awarded the Harrison Award, which goes to the outstanding student uh, at commencement every year. Janine and I had gotten to know each other. She had been in some theatrical productions, and she was one of the most amazing students I've ever had in terms of her maturity level and her way she thought and how she worked through things, and very giving. So when she was selected for this, we had a long conversation, and it was one of the stories I told her was about our town. And I said, when you're up there at that lectern and you're having a chance to talk to your fellow graduates, take it all in. Be conscious of it. Um, and it was, it's a good experience to have, to keep that, that concept in mind. All right, number seven, spend your time with positive people. I had a great recommendation when I was finishing my bachelor's in secondary ed. One of my uh, 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 cooperating teachers say, uh, said, if nothing else, if you don't learn anything else in this, on this student teaching round, stay out of the teacher's lounge. around people who are negative about everything suck the life out of you. Stay away from those people. Stay away from the teacher's lounge of your profession, wherever that is. Go hang out with people that are fired up about what they do, that love what they do, that want to commit to the things around them. That's where you learn things. That's what will keep you fired up. And that's your opportunity to be a positive influence on other people around you. Stay away from the really negative people. I heard that, Linda. Now, I will be honest with you. I could have found a nicer picture of Linda. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this is Linda Earls. But the fact that it's not a great picture is precisely my point. <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously. 
it's really insufferable to be around people who take themselves too seriously. And uh, Linda and I also taught IDC a few years before that. And she and I, Linda is kind of the sister I've never had. Uh, we banter about and take fun of one another and we did this in class and the students would sit back and, what are they doing? Uh, and, and we would have a ball with one another, laughing at each other, poking fun at one another as a part of what we did. Uh, and we've never taken one another very seriously. For any of you that have had Professor Earls in class, you know that there are things that happened to her that only could happen to her. And, and most of them are funny and embarrassing for her, and for some reason she keeps telling everybody about it. <laughs> but that's a great example of this. And Linda's a good example of somebody who doesn't take themselves too seriously. She should, because she's really good at what she does, but she doesn't take herself too seriously. And one more thing. Bear with me a second. This, I hope, is an example of me not taking myself seriously. <laughs> or, no, I'm not going to. All right. <laughs> all right. I want to thank all of you for coming. It means a lot to me that you took the time at the end of a day to come out and uh, spend a few minutes with me. Uh, I hope that what I said made sense to you. Um, I hope that, that the... Um, I've helped you spend a little bit of time in a positive way here today, and I hope this is the kind of thing that, you'll, uh, they'll, that you will take with you. I picked this as the last photo. Some of you may know Sam Martin, graduated last year, and that's a great closing photo, I think. Um, and you can be a wonderful positive influence on the people around you if you look for the opportunities. So don't, uh, don't pass them up when you have a chance. Um, I hope that my work and my contributions uh, will be seen that way to others. I hope they can be. Um, and it's my sincere hope that when I get to the end of my life, that my obituary can very plainly say he was a good man. That's all I want. Good night. <laughs>